I began hearing the lines and I began seeing kids playing Raiders games. I mean, it was really interesting to see that sort of happen. It was a giant turning point in my career to be associated with the first movie, mainly because I was sandwiched between George and Steven. And, um, you know, certainly you hope that something great is going to come out of the relationship, and it certainly has. So when I look back on it, at the time it was very exciting, but it had to be a secret, so I couldn't tell anybody. I didn't even tell my mom that I was doing this, because George said, you can't tell anybody. Stephen put this on my desk within maybe three weeks after we had finished the movie 1941. And I had moved in as his assistant, and he said, read this, it's my next movie, don't tell anybody about it. And I just kept going page by page by page, and it was incredible. It's still one of the best scripts I've ever read. And from that point on, it was a real ride. <laughs> You know why the character's called Dr. Indiana Jones? Indiana is the name of George's dog. <laughs> Everyone has a positive attitude when they do something like this, and you feel that you're doing the best job you can with it, or you hope you are. But you never anticipate, I never anticipate success uh, in, in that order of magnitude that the first three films achieved. I was surprised by it, I was delighted by it. And I was quite happy to do each of them as they came, more than happy. I had a great, great time doing all three of those films. So just before you make that break, it's like consideration, consideration, and choose that over this. Okay. I was, you know, very young in the process. So for me, when I first read Raiders of the Lost Ark, I saw Casablanca in my head. I mean, I saw a movie like Casablanca and it turned out you know in a sense to be in Stephen's mind much more of these kind of Saturday serial matinee kind of movies that he'd grown up with so I was quite stunned when I saw the film for the first time you know what it what it looked like when it all came together it was 1981 so I was 18 years old and it was so entertaining and just, I actually I was in um, Milwaukee, I, I grew up near Milwaukee and went into Milwaukee to see some movie that was sold out and they were having a sneak preview of this, which I'd never heard of and so we said, well, let's see the movie with the funny title instead. So it was the perfect way to see a movie because I knew nothing about it and never heard of it and it was just great. <sighs> so incredibly entertaining, but it was the first movie I saw where it occurred to me that someone wrote this, you know, in this case, Larry Kasdan. And not only did somebody write this, but they probably had a really great time at the office when they were doing it, because it, it just looked like such fun. And so it was sort of when I was starting to focus my thinking on being a screenwriter. I didn't see it when it first came out. I left it a while, I think it was word of mouth, said, hey, you should see this film, you know. Uh, and I went along and seen it, because you didn't really know what to expect. You knew it was kind of like one of those thriller, or it was a chase movie, or, you know, I've never really gone to the pictures thinking about that. You just fancy a film. I can't remember where I saw it. I have clear memories of seeing it. It was quite a, it was quite a su sort of groundbreaking film, I think. Whiskey. The humour and the action coming together in perfect blend. You know, there are images that I still remember very clearly. I mean, it's lasted well. I believe I saw Raiders pretty well when it came out. Somewhat against my will, I have to say, because uh, it was completely contrary to everything that I was trying to do at the time and the films that I wanted to be in. I wanted the Nouvelle Vague to reach England. And I mean, looking at it again, certainly retrospectively, there is a great deal more to them than just a, a simple adventure. It deals with imagination, and it was a great creation. You could get killed chasing after your damn fortune and glory. Maybe, but not today. Of course, you know, everyone in my primary school class wanted to kiss Harrison Ford, but I actually wanted to be Harrison Ford. I wanted to be Indiana Jones. <laughs> Well, my dad used to watch a lot of westerns. 
we'd watch a lot of spaghetti westerns. And other than that, I don't really remember my dad watching much of anything else, except for Indiana Jones. But I was really into it, you know? He was really into it. It was like a family get-together thing. Which, and it's like that for a lot of families. Most of my friends who've seen Indy found it through their parents. I have a lot of favorite scenes in the, the first Raiders film, but I think the scene that stands out for me the most is the basket chase. I don't have one particular moment that I can nominate as my favorite. There are lots and lots of moments that I have enjoyed seeing again. Not the man I knew 10 years ago. It's not the years, right? It's the mileage. I just thought, you know, when he and Karen Allen were on screen together, it was just electric. It was utterly transporting. You don't know what they've got there. Well, I know what I've got here. My favourite bit in that film was when, when the guy came out with the sword, giving it all the large. And he went on and on and on and uh, Harrison shot him. Which I thought was kind of the, the thing he should do. It was simple, you know? Indy shooting the guy with the scimitar instead of engaging in a bullwhip fight with him is just a moment of movie inspiration that will live forever. I'm going after that truck. Oh, I don't know. I'm making this up as I go. I have a lot of favorite scenes. I think that my favorite, which was the inspiration for the whole series in the end, was the truck chase. And him going under the truck with his whip and that whole thing, which is really where the, the concept of this whole thing started. I think the best set piece for me in Temple of Doom is the scene where Indy gets caught in that crusher chamber where the ceiling is coming down and the spikes come out of the hole. And Willie Scott is outside and Indy is trying to get her to find the release mechanism to reverse the crushing effect that's about to happen to him short round. And then she's got her hands full with bugs and she's panicking and freaking out over the bugs while he's trying to get her attention to put her hand in this really gross hole. We are going to die. That to me, that cutting back and forth is my favorite scene in the entire movie. He's such a man's man. He's the ultimate superhero. So when you put him in these vulnerable situations, it's hysterical. You watch Temple of Doom. Anytime he get into a situation, short round, he's vulnerable. He's talking to a kid. No mistake. Mistake. I'm very little. You. She's very big. Just any vulnerability with him is funny. He's really funny. A favorite line? Gee, there's a lot of good ones. It was in the script, but it was the way Harrison did it when he said snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? And then Salah comes in, which is an equally good line, I think. Larry Kazan wrote and said, asps, very dangerous. You go first. I know the dialogue's so sparkling, you know. I mean, from the first movie, Indy's line with Marion, you know, I can only say I'm sorry so many times. And she says, well, say it again. Do you know what you did to me in my life? I can only say I'm sorry so many times. <laughs> well, say it again anyway. I just love that. The third movie, remember Connery's line, I should have sent it to the Marx Brothers. It is a million of them. Can we discuss this later? I should have mailed it to the Marx Brothers. Will you take it easy? My favorite Indiana Jones film is the Crusade. Not just because Sean Connery was in it, not because of that reason, it's just a subject matter, you know? And it was the first one that actually tugged in your heartstrings a little bit for me. I remember at the end with the old knight standing there, who'd been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. I actually started crying. I think that, was, that got the emotions going, that one. I, I kind of like that. And I like the whole thing about the, the father and son element in it, you know? Of a son being brought to his dad and you know, finding one another again. So that was my favorite one. Keep looking down. Look, Sean C. looking down. <laughs> <laughs> I lost you. There was quite a talented group of people, and there was a real explosion in the area of the blockbuster movie kind of coming into its own with. Stephen having done Jaws and George having done Star Wars and then moving into the Indiana Jones series. And they were really at the forefront of that. 
But another aspect of this series that's been kind of interesting to me is that the number of, of filmmakers today, younger filmmakers, that come up to me and say, well, The Raiders of the Lost Ark was you know, why I got in the movie business and talk to me about how they watched it in film school and how they learned so much from it, how Steven shot that and the action sequences and the rest is history. Dark, Bellick's head blows up, Dietrich's head shrinks, and Tote's head melts right down to the skull. And so, you know, I said, fine, how are we going to do this? I had no idea how we were going to pull this off. So I certainly had the actors pose in the different positions. I had Bellick scream, I had Tote scream, I had Dietrich scream, and that's all ILM had. And it was up to them to go off and bring back to me an effect that was suitable, and I was amazed, especially at the melting head. I thought that was one of the most amazing effects I'd ever seen. And I love as the hat no longer fits him, but comes lower and lower and lower as the face drops away. It's pretty gory, pretty gross, but I love that effect. <gasps> When it was brought to me and said, "We, you know, let's let's do the the melting bit on it," I kind of said, "Okay, there's got to be a way to do that." I, <laughs> I'd never done it before; hadn't really done anything like it before. I didn't know anybody who'd done anything like it before. And the interesting thing is that the guys at Kerner Optical, which is the sort of model shop, creature shop, now separated from ILM, they're going through a simplified version of what I did to illustrate the basic steps of the process. And they'll be doing the casting an actor to get the negative mold. They'll be doing an underskull. They'll be doing the layers of gelatin to get the same basic effect. But I'll be very interested to see how they deal with it uh, because it was, it was a challenging shot. Okay, here we go. This is a rehearsal. Laughing and turning, Ronnie. The shot required Ronnie Lacey to have a facial cast, and that's I've had that done myself, and it's no fun. It's basically you're putting this goop on your face, this rubber material. The original uh, makeup man on the show would have used a material we call alginate, which is a material that dentists use a lot to make, take impressions of teeth, only we use it to take entire impressions of the head. So once they get that facial cast, then you have to go in and sculpt and fix and open the eyes and put eyes there and all this kind of stuff. So it was a very trepidatious experiment. Basically what I did was I took the negative mold, which was the face of the character, and the under skull had to be made out of stone to withstand the heat, and I had to sculpt it to actually sort of match the, the, the negative image of uh, the character. And then I left uh, you know, a space in there for the dimension of the, of the skin. I had worked with gelatin before and knew that it melted at, at a, you know, and was still very thick, so I decided to go with that and what I developed was a formula for the gelatin so that it was extremely delicate. Uh, it melted at a very low temperature, uh, but it also didn't last very long, which caused a lot of concerns. And the way it worked <laughs> was that 
I painted in very thin layers of gelatin every step of the way, each one a little bit different color, and as I did so, I would layer in veins. Some veins were made out of literally colored yarn soaked in gelatin so that there was stuff that would be dripping off and falling off as it happened. When we did the actual effect, it wound up being two propane space heaters headed straight on it, and I was underneath it with a heat gun with this hot gelatin dripping down on me, kind of like, oh, that's, that needs to melt a little quicker over here, and, and so really making moment-by-moment -moment adjustments. Even though uh, I got the gelatin move, uh, melting fairly quickly, it still was a long process. It still melted for, I think it was 10 minutes or something like that, eight or 10 minutes maybe. And so they had to speed it up in the lab. We did the shot. It went pretty darn well, actually, I thought, I, because I'd only done maybe three or four full tests of different gelatin mixes before I got to this one. But the other ones just melted all wrong and fell off before they were melted. And so we got really lucky on that take and, and everything worked really well. And it seemed to be a pretty effective shot in the film, so in the end I was happy with it. I cannot begin to tell you how many phone calls I got about that effect. Not just people who, you know, really appreciate it or are fans or whatever, but a lot of other makeup men, because everybody, suddenly everybody wanted to melt a head somewhere. And they went, so how did you do it? What was the formula? And I'm like, oh, I should have just published it somewhere, and, you know, uh, let everybody know that way. Because I, I, and I still get people who say, I love that effect. I, you know, how did you do that? And, you know, it's, it's, and it's been a long time. I think the most effective way to do the same effect today would be to do it practically the way I did it, but then computer enhance it afterwards, because there's a lot of stuff that shows up now. It shows the technique of what it was, but there's a lot, so much you can do with computers for cleaning up edges, smoothing things out, controlling compression, and a lot of the other elements that really, you know, bring it up. But you could use the same techniques to give the basic information for a computer to really embellish. I think that Tote's melting head is one of those images, once you've seen it, you never forget it. I mean, it's, it's grotesque and it's hideous to think about it, but once it's in the mind, it'll never leave. Such a nasty place. Why don't you come on down here? I'll show you. 
Thank you, my friend, but I think we are all very comfortable up here. That's right, isn't it? <laughs> yes, we are very comfortable up here. So once again, Jones, what was briefly yours is now mine. What a fitting end to your life's pursuits. You're about to become a permanent addition to this archaeological find. Who knows? In a thousand years, even you may be worth something. <laughs> Son of a bitch. I'm afraid we must be going now, Dr. Jones. Our prize is awaited in Berlin. But I do not wish to leave you down in that awful place, all alone. Slimy pig, you let me go! Stop it! She's of no use to us, only our mission for the Führer matters. I wonder sometimes, Monsieur, if you have that clearly in mind. It was not to be, Sherry. You bastards! I'll get you for this! Indiana Jones? Adieu. <laughs> Just get ready to run, whatever happens to me. What 